I'm talking to you today about um, the very first stars and how we can use observations of very metal poor stars and metal poor stars to understand the early universe. So I'm going to start with a bit of introduction, even though maybe many of the audience members will already know this. Um, in order for us to, when we say first stars and we, when we say origins, we need to go back to the beginning, all the way back to the Big Bang. And uh, the way we do this is that we are interested to look at the chemical qualities or the chemical elements uh, in the very first stars to better understand, uh, or the, the very model of stars to project back and understand the first stars. So how do we do this? Our understanding uh, currently is that uh, right after the Big Bang, a few seconds after the Big Bang, uh, the universe was made mainly from hydrogen and helium with little bits of uh, hints of lithium, beryllium, and boron. Um, these, these elements then formed the very first stars in the universe, uh, which what we know now from simulations and from some observations that they are believed to be massive stars. Uh, so they were short-lived. And so at the end of their lifetimes, they have exploded with energetic supernova that have ejected um, the very first heavy elements or anything heavier than boron in their atmospheres, which is from carbon and onward. After their explosions, they ejected this first metal production into the interstellar medium. And from that, uh, the second generation, or what we call the population two stars, must have formed. Um, these population two stars, we believe, are um, low mass. And so the cool thing about them is that some of them must have survived until the present day. So the whole premise of, uh, of my work and that of stellar archaeologists, uh, we are basically the Indiana Jones of the galaxy. We're trying to find very old low mass stars and then use them to um, project onto uh, our understanding of the early universe before them. Uh, why do we do this? Because our observable universe only allows us to see the first, uh, the, the, the stars that are came after the population two. So to understand the first stars, uh, people use cosmological simulations uh, from, um, from mini halos, from dark matter mini halos that collapsed to form the first stars. And I'm showing here a, a video of these simulations that was done by Brendan Griffin, uh, a former postdoc at MIT in the group of, of Anna Frebel, um, who tried, along with others, who tried to um, um, simulate the very formation of the very first stars. And you can see here uh, in yellow and red, the formation of a Milky Way like glaciers from the hierarchical collapse of um, halos. And um, we believe that the very first stars must have formed in these mini halos. So what we learned from these simulations uh, and others is that the properties of the first stars that are relevant to the star are the following. First, that they must have as I said, they must have formed in dark matter, I mean halos. They were very massive. They ranged between a 10 to 100 times the solar mass. However, it's kind of difficult to place a very, uh, very strict constraint on the masses. And I will talk about this later throughout this talk. Uh, they were short-lived um, because they were massive and so they are no longer around. And they must have exploded with energy. So this is what the simulations tell us. But if we really want to place observational constraints on the properties of the first stars, we have to go back to the observable universe. And what this provides us is these uh, very cool objects, the low mass population two stars, as I said, that are still around, some of which are still around in the Milky Way halo. And we use observations of these low mass stars uh, to then trace back using stellar archaeology to infer properties about the first stars, and this is what I will be talking about next. Uh, these population two stars, however, are not very easy to find. They are tricky little things. Uh, they are mainly found in the Milky Way halo uh, and are too faint whenever we find them. We need lots of time on, on large telescopes to be able to follow them back and find them with high resolution uh, spectroscopy. 
Um, however, uh, we usually go through multiple different steps to, in order to identify the oldest population to stars. Um, the easiest way is that low resolution spectroscopy, which is more common or more or less expensive than high resolution follow-up spectroscopy, allows us to identify the calcium etching K-line, which is very strong enough, even found in the spectra of these population to stars that usually rarely have any elements in them because the cosmos does not have enough time to produce many elements. So the calcium line is usually strong and we use this, we use some kind of calibration to actually project the kind of calibrate the first estimate of what we call metallicity or iron content in the stars uh, inferred from the calcium lines and whenever we find a star or stars that are interesting enough that have um, that we think are belong to this population two uh, population, so very low metallicity, we then go to the big telescopes in order to follow them up and observe more interesting elements and more. And so the, the, main, the main tools of our observations mine and that and that of other uh, archaeologists or stellar archaeologists is that we use optical and UV uh, spectra so we try to follow up these interesting population to stars that we've identified in the first round of low and medium resolution in order to obtain a more significant high resolution spectrum that allows us to go deep into their spectra and look at other elements and then we use this to try to infer the conditions of the early universe and the first stars. Now to give you a little bit of refresher for those in the audience who don't know a lot about those interesting metal poor stars. So metal poor stars by its regular definition when we say that we mean that it has an iron to hydrogen abundance below minus one and this has been introduced the first time by Tim Beers and Norbert Please in 2005 and then again in the in the review by Anna Frebel more recently. And then this nomenclature continues until we define different types of metal core stars. So whenever we find less uh, by the factor of 10 or even less of, of iron in these stars, we call them successively very metal poor stars, extremely metal poor stars, until whatever ridiculously metal poor nomenclature you want to call it for iron to hydrogen below minus 10. Of course, we have not found any star that is below minus 10 in terms of metallicity. However, the cosmos has actually been able to um, gift us with really nice uh, mega metal poor stars where some of them I list here, for example, that in uh, the color star that was discovered in 2014 that had an upper limit of iron to hydrogen below minus seven. And then David Aguado discovered another one in 2018 that we followed up as well with high resolution spectra. And more recently, uh, uh, Thomas Nordlander also discovered another mega metal poor star that had a, the, for the very first time a measured iron abundance that was below minus six. So we know that these gems do exist and we are finding them. It's difficult to find, but we are finding them. Now, when we want to use this to infer properties or when we, use, when we want to use stellar archaeology of these population through stars, we need to have some kind of infer, we need to have some kind of information of how many progenitors must have taken place or how many supernova explosions must have taken place for them to enrich the mini halo, the original primordial mini halo with elements to form these stars. Because ideally we would like to have a single progenitor uh, enrich this mini halo and then we can use this as a single fingerprint to then trace back the properties to the first parts. And so ideally there is no there's no particular way to say that if a star has such metallicity then it must have had one or two progenitors. However, we believe that the more metal poor the star is, so as we go toward the lower metallicity, they are more likely to have a single progenitor regime, or we call them mono-enriched. This so the gas from which they was they were formed must have come from a single explosion event. And this is quite useful because uh, this kind of outlines a little bit what I'm going to be talking to you about next. 
So the outline of the rest of my talk is I'm going to be telling you how I use these population to very metal poor stars in order, first of all, to understand the first stars and supernova explosions. I will be telling you about some cool results that we got last year of a very, very interesting hyper metal poor star that had a metallicity below minus five. I'm also going to be telling you how I use these metal poor stars to turn on my theory brain, which is what I do uh, in order to determine stellar, um, um, stellar abundances or precision abundances of these interesting metal core stars and what they allow us to learn about stellar physics. And then finally, I will give you also some updates about how we use these metal core stars to infer or to understand the heavy element production uh, with the R process uh, and some of the work that we have been doing in the R process alliance. So I'm going to start with our understanding or the first stars and supernova explosions. Um, one of the questions that I'm interested to answer in my research with stellar archaeology is um, what are the properties of the first stars and how can we use these population two stars to answer that? As I showed you before from cosmological simulations, they are unable to constrain very well the masses or the mass ranges of the very first star. They give us some approximate, um, some approximate range. However, what we do hope with observation is to be able to further constrain this number. Particularly, it's very interesting for us to constrain the masses of the first stars because this will also allow us to constrain the type of supernova explosions that they undergone. The type, of, the type of star and the mass of the star will then tell us what type of explosion happened and how energetic these were. And as we all know that the first stars were responsible for reionizing the universe. And so us being, being able to place a constraint on these, uh, these first star properties is quite important for multiple domains in astronomy, not only for stellar physics. The problem with that is uh, from theoretical uh, simulate or from cosmological simulations, as I said, they do not constrain this at all, the masses. You can see here uh, the mass ranges that have been predicted over the years by multiple uh, cosmological simulations and the masses of the first stars that they predicted they range from uh, less than one solar mass to more than a thousand solar mass. And so therefore it's not very well constraining and this is where this work comes into play. So what do we do in order to place a constraint on the first star properties? What we do is we measure the chemical compositions or the chemical abundances of the most metal poor stars that we can find and then use these to actually uh, fit models of first star supernova explosions, considering that we came from a single progenitor or a single event. And then we use these fits to infer the properties of the first stars. Particularly here, I'm going to be talking to you about one of uh, my favorite uh, population two stars uh, and that of others as well. This star is called HE 1327 2326. Not a very nice name, but it is very interesting and I'm going to be telling you why. Uh, this star is hypermetal poor, which means that it has um, iron to hydrogen abundance of below minus 5.2. It was discovered back in 2005 by Anna Frebel, but there have been many, many observations, mostly in the optical regime of this star. Uh, simply because these stars, as I said, they are usually very faint. And so it's difficult for us to follow up in the UVV. But then you ask me, why do we even want to follow these stars in UVV? So the optical spectrum usually allows us to measure chemical abundances, as you can see here on the x-axis of this plot, for a wide range of elements, uh, including the main ones that we use or that are interesting to us. We can measure CNO, we can measure alpha elements here, we can measure some of the iron peak elements. However, as we go toward the heavier elements around iron, for example, for um, for zinc, for nickel, we don't really have any measurements possible in the optical spectrum. And for that, we need to go to the UV in order to obtain these elements. Now, why do we need to measure um, 
the iron peak elements in these types of stars because the iron peak elements they are usually formed after the complete silicon burning and so they are a direct probe into the type of or they are they are they are formed during explosive nucleosynthesis and so they will be able to constrain the uh, explosion um, the explosion properties of the coordinator of this star and so before our observations, um, the, the common thing for this star and other types of similar types of stars, like the hypermolecular stars, they were usually fit with the supernova explosion yields of a first star progenitor, what we called a quasi-spherical supernova or a faint supernova, as you can see the energy here is presented. And this, this supernova um, yield usually fit most of the elements found in this and other type of stars fairly okay, especially that of the CNO and then the alpha elements. However, when we go toward the iron peak elements, you can see that this these types of models do not really constrain very much this, the, the chemical elements in, in this region. And so any detection of such elements in these types of stars, which is more difficult, obviously, would be great because it will be able to, it will help us to constrain the type of supernova explosion. And so in 2016, we were able to obtain COS UV spectra for, um, for this star. And, uh, in this spectrum, we were able for the very first time to detect a zinc detection, a very strong uh, line of zinc that was found, that's usually found in these types of stars at 2138. But what was interesting is that this zinc abundance that we measured relative to iron was very enhanced. It was 0 0.8. And this is not new. In fact, uh, we have known for quite some time right now that it was uh, quite puzzling. Why do metal poor stars, as we go toward lower metallicity, the zinc is always uh, constantly enhanced? And a lot of people have been working to try to answer this question. It's what produces zinc in the old stars and why, why, does it, why are they enhanced relative to iron? And there has been multiple scenarios proposed. One of those scenarios is that in order to actually enhance zinc or to produce a large amount of zinc in the star during the explosion, we would require what is called a jet-like supernova explosion, which is a hypernova, so a high energy explosion that would then emit or that would emit some kind of jets from the, along, uh, along the rotation. A rotation um, pool, and then this would emit part of the zinc that is formed at the end stages of the lifetime of the star during the explosion of the star along those folds and would emit the zinc outward, while most of the iron would then infall onto the nascent black hole. And indeed, when we try to fit these different models, so we try different models to fit this, our new zinc abundance, we find that the jet-like supernova will be able to fit our full abundance pattern of the star. However, spherical or quasi-spherical models that are usually used uh, are not able to fit uh, our abundance pattern for this star. This is quite interesting because this is one of the first observational evidence that supernova explosions uh, of first stars must have been, um, or aspherical supernova explosions with jets must have been common or, actually, or even took place in the first stars. And we tried to, to actually rule out or to, to test this in multiple ways. So did we do any kind of, um, was there any other model? What if we increase the energy of a spherical model? Will we, so we did a Monte Carlo sampling, statistical sampling, to 10,000 different models of spherical supernova explosions by varying the energies, the masses of the progenitor of the first star. Um, and we fit this to a large sample of also variations of our abundance pattern of, of HE 1327 within the uncertainties. As you can see here, no matter how much we change the energy or the mass of the supernova or the, of the first star, we are still unable to produce this large amount of zinc that we observe in this star. This is quite an interesting evidence that an aspherical supernova explosion could actually take place in the first star. Um, and so I've already explained this, that um, 
this is so what we the model that we did i'm happy to talk about it later in the questions or if you want to afterwards so the model that we used is a 2d model unfortunately there are no 3d models for a first star progenitor currently successful but hopefully many people are working on this and we're excited to do that but currently the model that we used is that by um nozomu tominaga and uh, kinichi nomoto from japan who simulated uh, this, this jet-like supernova explosion. And here I show you um, how these ejection of, of, of zinc along the cold state plates in order to enrich the iron, the gas from which we believe our star HG1327 uh, must have formed. Now, why is this exciting or what is the impl implication of a jet-like supernova taking place in the early universe? One of the things is that, as many of you know, and those who work in stellar archaeology of bird stars know, or population food stars know, that we have quite a wide range or a large scatter of the abundances that we see in these types of stars. What I mean is that we have a very, very wide uh, abundances that are measured, especially we see this in carbon. So you must have heard this term before, carbon enhanced metal for stars and others. Some of these metal uh, population food stars do not show this enhancement in carbon. And people have been working for a long time to try to address why do we see these two distinct populations of stars, one with carbon enhancement and the other with not. And some people suggested that maybe there was some kind of scenario of inhomogeneous mixing in the in the early um, gas from which these stars were formed but recent um, si simulations have also indicated that what if we actually have different formation scenarios or different channels of enrichment in the early universe that could have formed the stars. What I mean is that, as I showed before, the first stars must have formed in different mini halos, and these mini halos, we assume are primordial. So if we do have an aspherical jet-like supernova, what if these jets could actually eject the material of the third star into a neighboring mini halo? And therefore we have what we call an ex situ enrichment or an ex situ formation of star. What if we actually do have two types of formation and this could maybe explain the presence of carbon enhanced metal poor stars and non-carbon enhanced metal poor stars. This is all quite exciting and we actually suggested this in our work, but we are also excited for people doing cosmological simulations and I think already some people have started looking into this, of the possibility of this happening, uh, but at least we can show now that we do have um, an, obs uh, an observational evidence of, of these types of explosions or energetic explosions taking place in the early universe. So I've already talked about this. So this is all in the ex situ uh, scenario enrichment that we would like to further explore. On. We also encourage people who would like to further explore. Um, so this is my results uh, and our results that I wanted to touch on uh, in regard to the first stars and supernova explosions, which was quite exciting. But now I'd like to switch gears and talk a little bit about how I personally also like to use uh, the population two stars and very metal stars to understand stellar physics. Now, um, why do you, why is this important and why and everybody or some some of you must be saying oh well we know everything there is to stellar physics we actually don't <laughs> let me tell you why so we always you always hear astronomers or observers talking about abundances and abundances is not a measured property it is a modeled property because underlying our abundance measurements are uh, complicated with transfer codes that go in the background it's assume multiple approximations to make things easy. So some of these approximations I list here, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but mostly how do we divide our stellar atmospheres from plane parallel to spherical, the homogeneity, etc., 1D or 3D atmospheres. But one of the most commonly used assumption is called or assuming local thermodynamic equilibrium. And this is when we assume that the matter inside the star is in equilibrium with the radiation field when we look at it locally, which means that it simplifies things for us in the sense that we can assume that the properties of the gas inside of star can be defined by a single temperature at each depth or a single pressure. And so we just use an input model atmosphere into our radiative transfer code and this will solve things for us easily. However, 
we, this does not hold, this LTE condition or local thermodynamic does not hold in all types of stars because as you can imagine, we need a lot of matter in the place where, we, where this, with this equilibrium must be induced. So for example, in the atmospheres of giants or, or supergiants, but even metal poor stars where we have a paucity of matter, the LTE assumption does not hold very well. And so therefore we need to actually assume a full, uh, a full case of non-local thermodynamic equilibrium in the star to be able to determine accurate abundances. And non-LTE assumes the opposite of LTE, where every photon in the atmosphere that is that occupies an energy level of an of an element that is interesting to us that we're measuring its abundance, we, we have to assume that this photon carries non-local information and it depends on everything. So we have to account for all the radiative and collisional excitations that take place in the atmosphere of the star. So to give you a little bit more insight into this, in LTE, when we want to determine the abundance of a single line or a single transition, all we have to know is the information of the lower and upper energy, and then this gives us the abundance of its element or this line. However, in non-LTE, if we want to do this for a single line, we have to take into account all transitions that could possibly populate uh, or that could lead to the formation of this line, as I show in this Quartrian diagram of energy versus energy levels of a single iron, um, a neutral iron model atom. And so this is complicated work, however, it's important because I want to show you now something scary of what happens if we ignore this non LT. So one way that we um, quantify the departure from LTE is by using a departure coefficient, which is the ratio of the level population density in non-LTE over LTE. And I show it here as a function of uh, op op optical depth inside the atmosphere of the star on the x-axis. And so as we go toward lower, um, as we go toward um, um, lower values for optical depth we are going outside in the atmosphere of the star and you the line forming region is usually between minus three and minus two and you can see that for metal poor stars i'm showing here three stars so the sun which is solar abundance uh, solar metallicity and then we have he 1327 which i just talked about earlier and the color star which is even lower metallicity star as we go toward these very metal poor stars the departure coefficients grows really large and so as you can imagine this will highly affect the abundances that we incur and i will show you now what are these departures so usually to determine the stellar parameters of our star which are the first step into determining any um any consequent analysis of the abundance of the star we usually use the abundances of iron lines those of neutral and firstly ionized lines. And here I show the departure coefficients, or apologies, I show the difference between the non-LTE and LTE stellar parameters that we've done over 20 standard metal port stars. And so you can see as a function of metallicity. So the bluer color are more metal poor stars, the lighter color like yellow is, is more metal rich. And you can see that the differences in these stellar parameters when we ignore LTE can reach up to 500 Kelvin in temperature, up to one dex in gravity, uh, microturbulent velocity, which is also an important fudge factor that we use, can also have large effects. And the metallicity can grow, in, in terms of corrections, can grow up to 0.4 dex. And these are all larger than the typical um, uncertainties or error bars that I show here in red. And so these departures have, be, have to be taken into account in non-LTE for these types of stars. But what if we keep decreasing the metallicity? So this, this metallicity here stops at minus 3.5. But what, what, if we're, what about our hypermetal poor stars or those population food stars that I talked about earlier? Does the correction stop there? Unfortunately, it doesn't. As we go toward lower metallicity stars, the correction between non-LT and LT or the departures become even larger can get to even to up to one dex, uh, for example, for the most metal poor star that we know around minus seven. 
But interestingly, you can see that they follow some kind of linear pattern. So the correction follows a linear pattern in a study that we've done in 2007. And we found that you can determine a first approximate of these corrections by following this linear equation here that we derived, where if you know your LTE metallicity and want to know a first um, first order uh, correction to your metallicity in non-LTE, you can use this equation here, which actually works quite nicely, even when we apply it to less metal poor stars, um, benchmark stars that are quite studied, uh, that are studied quite often in the, in the literature. So we can, we can tell you that this, this relation actually works as a first approximate. Now, non-LTE is also important, not only for the stellar parameter derivation, but I will show you here some really cool preliminary work that I've done with a student last year at MIT. Uh, so we looked at what would happen to a stellar isochrone if we actually shifted from LTE to non-LTE. So what we've done here is we have transformed for the first time a LTE isochrone to taking for every single um, um, point or we try to take as many points as possible on an LTE isochrone and then correct this to stellar parameters and non-LTE that you see here in blue. As you can see that for this 11 giga year isochrone, we have quite an interesting shift in the isochrone and we plan to do this for more, uh, for more ages. And so uh, this is something that has been, has been expected for a while that the isochrones are not as accurate, though, especially those that are calculated in LTE, are not as uh, accurate as we expect them to be, especially for lower metallicity stars. And so this needs to be taken care of. So stay tuned for more results um, soon about this. Um, another application that I've done with another student for non-LTE is um, to solve some of the disputes that have been present for uh, global or clusters. So some of, as you, as you probably know, some of the global or clusters, um, there have been disputes on them whether they have a mono or multi uh, metallicity uh, population and one of those is the very well studied uh, global cluster M22 and I show here uh, two studies one by Mucarelli and one in 2015 and another by Lee et al in 2016 we had quite a dispute on whether this is a mono or uh, or multi metallicity global cluster but they both you were using LTE in different methods to, to derive the the distribution of metallicity and we did this again with Anna was a student uh, at MIT in the summer and we found that this is in fact uh, after applying non-IT this is in fact a mono uh, metallicity a global cluster um, and so we were able to help solve this dispute and so this is also work in progress that we are currently writing up um, I've talked about iron a lot. It's because an element that I liked and I've worked on quite a lot, but non-LTE is also present in other elements as shown here in the review by Maria Bergeman in 2014. And the corrections that you see here on the y-axis can actually um, be present for multiple elements and they vary. They, they're even present in solar type stars like the Sun and Procyon. And so non-LTE is quite important to take into account not only for low metallicity stars, but also for solar-like stars and this is a well-known problem and this can be important not only for low metallicity stars but for people studying exoplanets for example uh, as we know there is now uh, an attempt to try to connect the star and exoplanet chemical correlation and so this highly depends on the accuracy of the abundances that people measure in the star to correlate it to the to the exoplanet and so in this case I would recommend or highly recommend that people consider non-LTE corrections for their abundances before um, turning on computations. Um, how much more time do I have? Uh, we're reaching close to three o'clock, uh, but I don't know if people can hang around for a little bit longer to give you some extra time. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay, I'll keep going then. Let me know. 
Um, so speaking of these uh, non-LTE corrections, I would just like to highlight quickly some of the work that I've done on some of elements. So these are, if you are interested in these corrections, please uh, let me know afterwards and I'm happy to talk to you. We've worked on some of the elements here and there are some atoms in the work that we are currently working on with my collaborator Thibault Merle, mainly the uh, iron peak elements um, because they are quite interesting and have not been well studied um, in the literature before uh, uh, in terms of their non-LTE corrections. So finally, I want to just talk a little bit about some updates from the R Process Alliance and uh, our work on the R Process and our, fi our most recent results. Uh, so um, the R process, as many of you probably know, is responsible for the formation of elements in the periodic table that are heavier um, than, than strontium and uh, other elements. So we, we, there have been multiple debate or multiple, uh, a big conversation lately about the sites or the dominant sites of the formation of the R process, starting from earlier on where people thought that uh, the site of the R process was um, supernovae explosions, whereas after the discovery of, this, of the neutron star merger uh, event uh, that LIGO detected in other telescopes in 2017, the eyes were all turned around to see if this could indeed produce the R process um, as expected. And this is, um, I will show this quickly, but I'm sure a lot of you know this from GINA, uh, are attending any GINA event, is that uh, this is this was done by Donna Slipuner, um, who um, simulated that in a neutron star merger, a few seconds after this merger, uh, the possibility of forming all the heavy elements and their beta decay onto the valley of stability, and indeed, um, uh, it was pretty exciting to see this in 2017 uh, that we were able to see a kilonova associated with the R process um, taking place. Um, now, how does this relate to very metal poor stars and our understanding of, the form of, of these elements? So, what's very exciting uh, is that in metal poor stars that have been studied before, and I show here an example of the Sneedon star in 2008, which was one of the first R process enhanced stars, we see what we call a universal R process abundance pattern uh, that scales well with the solar system R process, which indicates that the R process must be produced by a unique event um, and even more metal poor stars, as we discover more of these, we can we see that this mostly fits around the abundance pattern of, of, the, of the solar system. But we still have a lot of questions that we want to answer about the R process, even if we have been able to answer one of the questions of the sites in terms of the neutron star merger event, we still have many questions on to what produces all the peaks or the different peaks. We still see some variation in the first peak, for example, of the R process. And so we also want to learn more about the theoretical and experimental constraints on the R process, which still have many open questions. And this is why observers um, from, from the US and other places have created what we um, our, the collaboration called the R Process Alliance. And um, within the last few years, we have been quite active to try to find uh, the most exciting R Process stars in the Milky Way halo uh, and build up a population of R Process to answer some of these questions. And I show some of the members, some of the core members and the members associated with the R Process. So the main thing that we do is we try to look for the europium line or measure the europium abundance um, in these lines in these stars, our process enhanced stars, which is usually quite enhanced relative to iron. Now, why, why, what, what, what is the significance of this work that we've done in the R process alliance? This is a very uh, focused work that we are vetting thousands of targets from uh, multiple catalogs, including RAVE, LAMOS, SkyMapper, and then following them up with telescopes from all over the world, uh, continuously getting as much time as we can on the telescope to identify more of these R process uh, stars. And our target is to reach um, about 100 or more highly enhanced R process stars, which have a europium over iron, as you can see here, more than one in addition that we call R2 stars, in addition to other less enhanced stars uh, we call the R1. And I will show you here some exciting results 
results that we've had. So in the literature from 2003 to 2015, there was about eight to 10 uh, process enhanced SARS identified because people, because there wasn't this, this very focused work on this. But uh, with the R Process Alliance, um, there was a few data releases, and I show here how we were able to more than double the um, the R, R Process Enhanced Identified Stars, uh, and there is more to come. So stay tuned to this work um, as we as we release these stars, and um, we we aim that for the community and for us to use them to place constraints on the on the R Process. And I just highlight some some of the results here, but. Uh, Erica Holmbeck and myself have a pa have papers coming out quite soon of more identified R process. And here I will just go quickly over this. So I'm sure you all know this. Uh, the R process is quite interesting because it said that how these stars we will use them to uh, constrain the um, the nature of the sites, including whether the birth of a neutron star or the death of a neutron star. So recently we've heard that some uh, collapsars are able to produce also our process elements. So we want to use this to constrain uh, what fraction of the elements are produced with neutron star mergers and what fraction is obtained with collapsars. So uh, I will skip over this because I've already mentioned it. I'm going to just go to my uh, takeaway points. So, um, uh, I hope that I was able to show you in this talk that the very metal poor stars, the oldest stars in our galaxy are very exciting because uh, they allow us to, they are truly fossils of the early universe. We can use them to answer standing questions about the first stars and the first supernova explosions and their geometries and their properties, but also the formation of the heavy elements. We can also use them to constrain the models of stellar astrophysics using non-LTE radiative transfer codes and what we need to do is keep digging for more uh, stars. Thank you very much for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for the presentation. These are really, really interesting and exciting results. Um, we have some time for questions. I know we're running a little behind, but if everyone could stay tuned, um, feel free to jump in with questions, uh, type them in the chat or raise your hand uh, and we'll make sure your questions get answered. All right, I see a, a hand raised. Alex, go ahead. Hi, Rana, it's Alex. Hey. Uh, thanks a lot for that, that was really awesome. Um, I have a question about um, the non-LTE and sort of what is needed to continue expanding that to other elements. Um, is it a limitation um, on the modeling side or is it a limitation on the data side? Like, is it uh, how much do we need to invest in um, atomic experiments to address that? That's a good question. Um, it is indeed a limitation, I think I would say from both. Uh, from the data collection side, as we know, as, you, as I just said, and you know, we need to include a large amount of data, including um, different types of transitions that take place uh, in, the, in the atmosphere, including radiative, collisional. So uh, in order to do that, we need to make sure that our, our data or our input data is actually quite accurate and mostly comes from quantum mechanical calculations. These calculations are, are not found for, uh, for a lot of elements. Um, they are also quite difficult to even measure for heavier elements. So as we go to a heavier element in the periodic table, obviously it's all the shredding your equation, getting these calculations are becomes more difficult. And so I would really recommend investing in, 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 in um, actually um, funding groups who, who are available and I've done this work um, in, in various places in the US and other places to, to get, uh, you know, get on more of these calculations, more difficult calculations. Um, in addition to that, I think we also need people doing the calculations, right? So if the data is available, it takes quite some time to put in a model atom that is we think is, is good enough and has been well tested to perform a large amount of calculations. And as you know, this is quite computationally expensive. So the presence of supercomputers or computing capabilities to apply this to a large number of stellar parameters and making these grids available for the community is also something that needs to be invested in opinion. Other questions?
All right, if not, I'll jump in. Um, do you have sort of a dream observation or upcoming observing mission that'll sort of give you the biggest constraints and answer the most questions for your science? Um, I think that uh, I, would, I would say investing in any UV uh, space mission would be really awesome. And I haven't talked about this, but I'm sure if you've ever heard uh, Ian Roder talk or give a talk in Gina, he has talked a lot about this and the importance of, of having the UV because it allows us to have access to elements that indeed are difficult, as I showed for zinc and for example, others, and also additional R process heavy elements like gold and others that we cannot find in the detect in the optical, this will help us to have a, a continuous or, or a, a, a more complete uh, abundance pattern that we use, whether it's for the R process or whether it's for hypermolecular stars and other stars to, to, to infer more information about the chemical enrichment events and their progenitors. So I think I would say that. Uh, Obviously, also to go toward fainter targets, so all of the targets that we follow up are fairly um, bright, uh, so we need bigger telescopes and, and higher resolution spectrographs, um, so anything um, that's, that goes in that direction would be, would be, would be awesome. Thanks, yeah. Um, any more questions? I'm not seeing any. There's yeah, one on uh, oh, feel right. free to jump in. Yeah. Go ahead, yeah. Will the James Webb um, telescope um, add more data that uh, will help uh, with the models? What we believe is that the, or my understanding is that the James Webb will be able to look at the first population of, of first stars rather than individual stars. Uh, plus, uh, the infrared is not um, is not really it doesn't contain a lot of uh, elements or a lot of lines that that are of interest to us so far. Uh, so I think that it will definitely help us understand the conditions of the early universe, the conditions of the first population of stars. But I don't think it will be giving us direct. Uh, first data that we can use uh, using stellar archaeology. Thanks. <clears throat> Alex, did you have another question? I was just going to say there's a comment in the chat. Oh, okay. Oh, I missed that. Thank you. Um, so there's a, a, a question in the chat. I don't know if you can see this, Rana. Uh, I can't, yeah, but okay. I can. Okay, I'll, I can read it. Okay. Um, it says that it's agreed 100% on the jet supernovae uh, being a great way to drive a high zinc to iron ratio. Um, but the question is, uh, is it possible for the latest new, new grid yields to provide a mechanism to get high zinc to iron without a jet? Um, there's a link to a paper here, uh, and it looks like it may be possible to do that for 15 solar mass models to get a very high zinc to iron. I don't know if you know anything about this result. Um, yeah. I, I can't access the paper right now, but I'm happy yeah. to look at it. Yeah, I mean, okay. I think so. we try to look at many different scenarios. I didn't talk about all the scenarios that we tried to rule out before we fit our data to, um, to the jet like supernova. And I think that it's not something that we decided to just come up with. This is something that has been suggested uh, that we need a high entropy environment in order to produce the iron peak elements or enhance them to much higher values than the solar values. And so um, this is why um, this is why we try to fit our models and we work with our collaborators in Japan to do that. But of course, I'm, I'm happy to look at, at the link that they've added. I'm happy to talk to anyone about, about this some more. Any final questions? All right. Well, in that case, we can uh, wrap things up. Thank you, Rana, for giving the talk. Thank um, you, sorry. Sorry I had that initial fun. delay. Yeah, thank <laughs> you for your patience and for hanging out some more. Stay safe, everyone. Of course. Yeah, take care, everyone. Um, we'll have another seminar in about two weeks. Uh, so hopefully we'll see you all then.